Welcome to the Steve Ames Show with guitarist Sandy Renda, pianist Mike Yanuzzi, and my special guests, actor-comedian Erwin Corey and entertainer Spats Donovan. And now, on with the show. Stole my heart away, who makes me dream all day? Dreams I know can never be true. Seems as though I'll ever be blue. Who means my happiness? Who would I answer yes to? Well, you ought to know who. No one but you. Stole my heart away, who makes me dream all day? Dreams I know can never be true. Seems as though I'll ever be blue. Who means my happiness? Who would I answer yes to? Well, you ought to guess who. No one but. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show here at the Holiday Inn in Springfield, New Jersey. We opened up with the song, Who, with music by Jerome Kern and lyrics by Otto Harbeck and Oscar Hammerstein. And right now, I'd like you to meet the two mighty musicians at the guitar, Sandy Renda, and at the piano, Mike Yanuzzi. And we're opening up tonight's show with songs composed by the great Jerome Kern, who was born on January 27th, 1885, in Newark, New Jersey. Now, this next Kern melody was composed for the film version of the big Broadway hit, Roberta. And the RKO film starred Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, and Irene Dunn. And here's my favorite song from that score with music by Jerome Kern and lyrics by Dorothy Fields. Lovely to look at, delightful to know, and heaven to kiss. A combination like this is quite my most impossible scheme come true. Imagine finding a dream like you. Lovely to look at, it's thrilling to hold. You terribly tired. Far where together the moon is new. And oh, it's lovely to look at you tonight. to look at, it's thrilling to hold, you terribly tired, far where together the moon is new, and oh, it's lovely to look at you tonight. Well, Sandy and Mike, we've certainly got the cream of the crop of American popular songs on the Steve Ames Show. On last month's show, we pay tribute to the centennial of Johnny Mercer with an all Mercer song fest. And tonight, it's Jerome Kern. So, uh, Sandy, what will you and Mike be performing for us in honor of the great Jerome Kern? All the things you are, one of the best. Absolutely. And this is a special jazz version of the song? Yeah, we're doing our own little jazz version of it. That's a standard tune that can be done vocally or instrumentally. So many artists have done it. We'll give it our own little special touch. Okay, this will be an instrumental, but we just want to mention that the original lyrics were written by Oscar Hammerstein II with music by Jerome Kern. And right now you will hear the melody played by Sandy Renda and Mike Yanuzzi.
now, here is part two of my recent interview with actor, comedian, and professor Erwin Corey, taped on location at his New York City residence. Joining in on the fun is my pal, entertainer Spats Donovan. And who were some of the other entertainers and comedians playing around the same time? In oh, that there era? was the Kingston Trio, there was the uh, Limelighters, there was. Uh, the Gatsons, who were they? The Granderson. The Granderson group, a wonderful group. Did Mort Saul also play there? Mort Saul, I followed him. And Bob Newhart? Newhart played there. Lenny Bruce played there. Barbara Streisand. Wow. Harry Belafonte. Bill Cosby. Woody Allen? Woody Allen. What a wonderful era. And did you get to become friendly with most of how these about people? Dick Greg how about Dick Gregory? I got Dick Gregory his job. Really? I refused to work at the Playboy Club in Chicago on Sundays. And uh, Dick was in a car wash, but he also did nightclubs for the black people. But he came to, took my place on Sunday, and there was a convention of Southerners, and he was telling his uh, stories. And they howled at him. Little, you know, they know that he was making fun of them. Right. And then he came to the hungry eye. That's wonderful. A lot of comedians were influenced by you, I understand. I, Including I Jonathan know. Winters, I heard. Quite, quite a few of them. Your improvisational style. Well, the one that really said, admitted that he uh, has his act based on my performances was Norm Crosby. Oh, yes, with the malapropisms. Yes. Norm Crosby, we still see him on the Jerry Lewis telethon every yeah, year. He's fine. I'd like to ask you, you who influenced Erwin Corey when you were a young man? Well, uh, maybe sublinearly, uh, Robert Benchley. Oh, a great wit, yes. And you see him in those old MGM shorts that he used to do. Yeah. Did you ever meet Robert Benchley? He gave me permission to use one of his routines called the Pre Treasures Report. Really? That's marvelous. So you I remember that. I was doing the Treasures Report for an English-speaking branch of the IWO, the International Workers Order. And for the first pages, I didn't get any laughs at all. And then all of a sudden, somebody started to laugh, and there was a fight. Mm. Because one of the members was saying, what are you laughing at him for? He's doing us a favor. <laughs> <laughs> now, I read that Charlie Chaplin and the Marx Brothers were a big influence on you in the early days. They might have been, but people are not really conscious of where they get their, their uh, education. I don't think so. Now, you write most of your material, right? Did you? I don't write them. I, uh, you say it. Improvising. Improvising. Uh, so you were one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer, in improvisational comedy. Because I don't think anyone was doing that type of comedy before you came along. Totally extemporaneous. Yeah, Spats, would you like to... Uh... And nobody is doing my comedy yet. <laughs> <laughs> Spats, give me you your know, viewpoint on Erwin Corey's comedy. Well, in my humble estimation, for, what, for, for whatever it's worth, I think that uh, Erwin Corey, uh, the professor himself, is is probably the great pioneer of extemporanea improvisation. Like you say, uh, you know, I mean, how uh, Robin Williams was influenced That's by right. Jonathan Winters. Correct. Oh, my goodness, Marty Frickin'. <laughs> woo -wee! You know, and, and, but when I think of Erwin Corey, I, th I think of, like, Professor Van Quack, I mean, from Walt Disney. I mean, like, this just this outrageous uh, mind that just goes in all directions. That's right. And 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 is is profound and yet ridiculous and silly, and mischievous and, and much like a rascal, but undertones of wonderful social consciousness, and an amazing political uh, political uh, substance as well. So I, it's not parody, but it's satire. It's like almost uh, a, 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 a cro he's a cross between burlesque and heavy-duty political and social consciousness. I agree. And always an original. 
and we've mentioned your career in recordings, on Broadway, on television. Now let's talk about the movies. You've been in several films, and you stole every film you were in. You, that, that's how good you were. Yeah, I had to give them back so that they can show them on television. <laughs> now, what was your first movie? Was that the one with Bob Hope and Jackie Gleason? That's the one, How to Commit Marriage. I've seen that. It's a good picture. And Hi, the, uh, Bob Hope, and I just want to say that uh, when I worked with Professor Irwin Corey, he played a guru in How to Commit Marriage. That's right, with the great one, uh, my, my golfing buddy, Gleason. It was Gleason, Corey, and, and myself. No thanks for that memory. <laughs> That's right. What do you say there, uh, the great one? I'm telling you that, Professor Erwin Corey. <laughs> Pow, zoom, right to the moon. Well, you were just great in that picture as the guru. You had yes, a good uh, and, and one of the papers in Miami where it opened said that the only funny thing in the show is Professor Corey. That he, was a terrific he performance. He stole the show. Impresario, it is written, when the most humble enjoy the fruits of wealth, then the wealthy become richer in the poor of poverty, then the development of those who retrogress feel that the umbilicals upon those who tranquilitize, and therefore, many times over. Superior wisdom from a superior mind. Oh, how you doing? I like your hair, man. It's bad. It's bad. It's him, man. Always got the bomb. We need to make victim. He'll blow us up. You want help? I got something for you. How old are you? Oh, you know damn well how old. How old? Thirty-three. Wrong. When you was four and the house was crowded with Abe and Benny and the cousin and all the girls to look after. Helen said we gotta get you into school a year early. Okay. Benny gets a blank certificate from a friend, works for the city, we make you a year older. You're a kid. We're afraid you spill the beans at school and we don't tell you the truth. A couple of years go by. You were happy then. You didn't need it. Finally, I put in my will. Three grand for each girl and a year for Sally. Today, I figured you need it. And there it is. You're 32. You got a year. Don't blow it. <laughs> You're a lunatic. Thanks, Pop. Thanks for the extra year. Dummy, don't you know? They're all extra year. Not a secret of cracking boxes opening safes to you is based on the presumption that what is on the inside cannot be outside. And what is on the outside, stop eating. We're gonna have intermission later. That Clara, she had fire in her mouth. Me, I would settle for a few teeth. Charlie, you gotta help me with this. Really, keep your ears open. Anything you hear, I gotta know. It's very important to me, okay? 50. You must be desperate. You know where to reach me. Keep eating the carrots. I think they're working. We want to talk about your wife. You've been married about, what, 69 years? Uh, November 22nd, 1940 was the first anniversary. So you will be married 69 years next month. 69 years. Well, wow. that's wonderful. That that's just amazing. terrific. Wonderful. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing phenomenon. That's terrific. So you've had Does a she great stop billing? great marriage here and we met your son Richard and you've got grandchildren and you're living here in this lovely and house. And great grandchildren. And great grandchildren. That's marvelous. How long have you lived here at this residence in New York here? I think we moved here in 1976. But uh, my son and daughter bought the house in 1974. Very good. Well, it's a wonderful location. And the great thing is that you were still active and you were still performing at the age of 95. Yes, that's true. That's good. Well, everybody performs at their own age and is always performing, whether it's a, a, a conscious uh, effort or... Um, just so you don't accident. have to be in show business to be a performer. You're performing when you get up in the morning, right? That's true. That's great. Well, I love the fact that you're still doing shows. That's wonderful. If you get a movie offer, you'll take it, right? Every time. 
That's good. <laughs> and you would even want to go back to Broadway if the opportunity came up. It was a funny thing in that uh, I did uh, uh, came into the shrew, and Zoe Caldwell Whitehead was the uh, director. And there was one part where the Sly, uh, Christopher Sly, was thrown out of a pub, and he's on the sidewalk, dead drunk. The players came in, and we're going to do a little shenanigans with this character. They make believe he's a lord, they give him nice clothes, jewelry, a wife. And he says, after a while, he was a tinker, which is the lowest uh, category of labor on the ladder, a tinker. It's like today, uh, uh, a fellow that sweeps the streets. All right. So I said, my God, I am a lord. I'm not a tinker like Christopher Sly. And one day I says, my God, I am a lord. I'm not a stinker like Christopher Sly. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you've also, besides being a comedian, you've also done dramatic roles. Yes, these was a dramatic role. The guru was dramatic. The character in uh, in Crackers, and um, well, there were other. Do you movies. enjoy the dramatic roles as much as the comedy? It isn't a matter of enjoying. Whenever, whatever I'm doing, I'm enjoying. That's wonderful. Irwin? Whether it's comedy, tragedy, or uh, just uh, misbehaving. <laughs> Spatz wants to ask I you something. wanted to ask you, um, it's true that Carl Reiner and um, Sid Caesar, with their, the character, the professor, on the old Imogene Sid Caesar, you know, Caesar's comedy. Show of shows, right. Yeah. I'm sure that Sid were, Caesar he was saw a, me because... He even almost used part of my costume. Yeah, he with the top hat, right? He, and the you know, frock coat. That professor routine, you influenced them. Do you think they they stole that from you, or I, I'm I don't know that I personally uh, was the cause of their uh, success, but uh, everybody imitates everybody. They're not conscious of it. Right. I'm sure that Chaplin did not figure out what kind of a costume he's going to wear. Whatever was available, he used. That's right. That's how it happened. And that's how it happened with me. That's true. Well, tell me, Ir yeah, Irwin. Yeah, let's hear that story. Yeah, how did you discover your costume, your frock coat, your top hat? How did that come about? That was all the stuff that was around at the Brooks Brothers at the time. I didn't uh, consciously uh, look for a, a, a costume. I just took whatever was there. That's See, marvelous. This, uh, this right over here is the like uh, the, the picture. Oh, you know, I used to have costume. medals. I used to have a scarf around my neck, you know. Uh, so you downgraded. You went from uh, all of that to the it top hat. It started to get too hot, so I took off the scarf. Right. Then that, I took off the sweat, the, the uh, sweater, uh, slip over, they call it. Well, that's wonderful. And Irwin, are we going to have reissues of the recordings that you made back in the 50s and 60s onto CD? Because a new generation would love to hear oh, those. I think there's a law against that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have so many fond memories of watching you on the Joe Franklin Show, the Mike Douglas Show, the Merv Griffin Show, on the all Joe of those Franklin shows. Show, a friend of mine was opening a nightclub. I told him not to open it. Or if he does open it, and he does business the first few days to sell. And we were on the Joe Franklin show with the guy with the peppermint lounge, what's his name? D? Joey D. Joey D? Right. So Joey D and myself were friends of this new uh, nightclub owner, and we told him not to do it. And on the television show, I says to the, the audience, my friend is opening up this nightclub, and it's in uh, Queens, and the first 10,000 people are free. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to kill me. <laughs> oh, what a memory. Did you do some TV commercials along the way? Well, I did one for uh, Pepsi-Cola, one for um, Folsom Bread, 
Do you remember I, the lines in the commercials? Because commercials are catchy. One one commercial I said, uh, the, the, Folsom had a slogan at, at Scott Fresh. So I said, Hold some breasts. It's got fresh. Fresh in it, fresh on it, fresh under it. <laughs> and many people ask, what are fresh? It's not what are fresh. It's what am fresh. And what am fresh is wholesome. To quote Ibid, wholesome bread stays one day longer, stays fresh one day longer. Now, this was an ad lib that they used. And in Texas, they had to take it off the show, uh, off the uh, air, because the school kids were saying, what am <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> well, they finally put it back. Well, that's wonderful. And what is your philosophy of reaching the age of 95 in good health and good spirits? What can, advice can you give? Well, I always listen to a guy named uh, Jack Fona, who was writing the... Um, the uh, log, the history of the Civil War. And he said that during the Civil War, useless as Grant gave an order, all Jews must leave Tennessee. When Lincoln heard of the order, he rescinded it. But by the time he rescinded it, the two Jews already left. Oh. <laughs> Spats, in closing, what would you like to say about our good friend, the you know, professor? You know, i, I got to tell you, I come from a generation of uh, show business that was kind of counterculture. I mean, when you talk about uh, the committee and, and uh, of Kentucky Fried Theater and Second City and uh, Bread and Puppet Theater in Boston and, and all, this, all these things that were going on in, in the 60s. And here's, a, here's a, 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 what I call a comic genius uh, that was pre hippies. I mean, it's like the, like I would call a, a definitely a beat legend, a beat comedian, uh, and this is uh, uh, somebody who, actually, everybody, including Steve Allen and and all these people, would probably be influenced by his innovativeness and his inventiveness and his ingenuity and his imagination, because he was lightning quick with his mind, and and, uh, and he, he would always entertain, because he could take you in all sorts of different directions and, and, and keep you laughing at the same time. That's the important thing. He can make you think and make you, and make you laugh. Uh, he, he, and people would walk out of a nightclub after his performance, and they would, f he, they would be thinking and laughing at the same time, and they would forget where they park their car. <laughs> so here we've got the original thinking man's comedian. Yes. And in closing, Irwin, what would you like to say to all your fans out there, new ones and old ones? What would you like to say to the public? Uh, I will say that life is an amazing phenomenon. It's a miraculous process that has no meaning or purpose. Life is a miracle. Walking on the water was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. And think about that when you go to bed at night. And if you do think about that when, when you go to bed at night, you shouldn't be allowed to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our very, very special guest, the wonderful Professor Irwin Corey and my Hi. buddy Spatz. Good thank idea. you, Irwin. Thank you, Spatz. Good day, Spatz. A fine romance with no kisses. A fine romance, my friend. This is, we should be like a couple of hot tomatoes. But you're as cold as yesterday's mashed potatoes. A fine romance You won't nestle A fine romance You won't wrestle I might as well play bridge with my old maid aunts I haven't got a chance 
This is a fine romance A fine romance For this fellow You take romance I'll take cello Just as cold as seals in the Arctic Ocean at least they flap their fins to express emotion. A fine romance with no clinches. A fine romance with no pinches. You're just as hard to land as the Ile de France. I haven't got a chance. This is a fine romance. Good night. <laughs>